Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Walk 21 Ireland, uh, the conference here today in TU Dublin. My name is Jennifer Boyer. I am the Vice President for Sustainability at Ireland's first technological university. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you here today in the East Quad building and our beautiful concert hall, which sits within what is now Ireland's largest art center. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to all of the delegates that are attending from around the world online joining us via live stream. This morning, we will begin with a short welcome from Minister Eamon Ryan. Thank you. Good morning. Eamon Ryan is my name, Minister of Transport in the Irish Government. And on behalf of our department, and our also government agencies, Sport Ireland and the Department of Health, who are co-sponsoring this event along with us, I'd like to welcome you. I hope it's a really successful and fruitful conference. We have a lot to learn from the expertise that's coming to Dublin this week from all over the world in how we can reimagine our communities, how we can create new safe spaces for people to walk, to build up a sense of public realm, place where, as my colleague Karen Coff always says, you can let go of the hand of a five-year-old and not be terrified that they mightn't be safe. It's really important that we learn from each other. And I think Dublin is a good place to look and think and consider about what we're doing in promoting walking as a sustainable mobility option. We're investing significantly, 20% of our capital budget each year, in walking and cycling. We are actually starting to take action, starting to take the traffic out of the likes of Cable Street, starting down in Cork to make public realm a really important part of how a city works and functions. But we're only at the beginning of what has to be a revolution in my mind to put us all back on our two feet for our health, for transport systems to work, to lower carbon emissions, to build up communities, which is, I think, one of the best reasons for us to create, to push this form of transport as the way to go. Look forward to taking part myself in a panel tomorrow, and I wish you all the very best of luck. Dublin can be a good city to actually thrash out and think about the future. It's a convivial social city, partly because it's a good walking city. So let's use it as a location to think about how we change the world of walking, starting one step at a time. Thank you. This is a very special moment for TU Dublin to be hosting such a significant international conference following what has been a very challenging and transformative period for global sustainability. The climate emergency we all know, the global pandemic we've all lived through, human injustice and war that continues, and now an acute energy crisis. With all of this, we are really grateful to be here together Oh, <laughs> those are the lovely children that we've been working with. Um, with all of this, we're really grateful to be here together uh, as colleagues, as academics, uh, as practitioners, uh, and as politicians, um, because together we provide that voice to activate and make a better world together, one that is inclusive, safe, and resilient for all. Our mission at TU Dublin is to become one of the world's most sustainable universities. We have also set ourselves an, ambition, an ambitious target of becoming climate neutral and carbon neutral by 2040. To do this, though, it requires all of us to play key roles in our daily work and in our daily lives, acting as agents for change and putting into practice what we teach about being open, inclusive, and responsible citizens. We need all the solutions on the table, working together in a coordinated fashion to achieve these goals. And I can think of no better, no more human activity than walking to illustrate scalable solutions for how individuals working together as a community, as Minister Ryan said, can influence policy for the betterment of our health, our happiness, in a way that reduces our carbon impacts on our environment and through an activity that allows us to enjoy the beautiful world around us that of neighbors or of nature. Thankfully, the government of Ireland also sees this opportunity for society through the activity of walking and has generously provided funding from across three government departments to hold this conference today. The support of the holistic approach to government thinking for sustainability 
is core to this conference in making our cities and communities livable and walkable. This year's conference theme, A Decade to Change, came and was developed from the Walk 21 Steering Committee members. It's great to see many of you here today. And it signals our understanding of the sense of urgency and time-bound nature of our recommendations and actions from this conference space today to achieve a sustainable active transport system as we approach 2030. This conference has been planned by an amazing team of TU Dublin and Walk 21 people that I'd like to say a special thanks to, especially Ann Campion, Ailish Lally, Aideen Ryan, Ralph Tinga, Gavin Lane, Rebecca Flanagan, and our conference lead, the amazing Dr. Lorraine Darcy. As we kick off the conference on day one, we will hear from a variety of key speakers this morning to bring you a global view on walking, to shine a spotlight on where emergent best practices lie, to provide academic insights on how far we've come and where we might go next, and to hear about cross-European initiatives that are underway to more closely join up our thinking so that we can deliver on systemic change to make our towns and cities more livable, walkable communities. Before I welcome our next speakers to the stage and to ensure your comfort and safety during the conference, I'd like to ask you uh, to respect that this campus is a smoke-free campus, so that means there's no smoking or vaping on campus. I'd also like you all to check that your mobile phones are on silent. And should anyone require a break from the busyness and the intensity of what this conference offers, we've provided several quiet rooms throughout the East Quad to be made available to delegates throughout the week. And lastly, in the event of emergency, please follow the exit signs and leave the building and gather out to the right-hand side through the rotating doors to our nearest fire assembly point. Now, without further ado, you are all in the land of 100,000 welcomes. I would like to invite our president of TU Dublin, Professor David Fitzpatrick, to welcome you all today. Good morning. Only another 99,999 welcomes to go. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to welcome you here, physically and virtually, to the Walk 21 Ireland conference that we are only too delighted to host in Technological University Dublin. TU Dublin was formed through the integration of three former institutes of technology and is actually less than four years old. The building you're in today was only completed just over a year ago. And although we are essentially brand new and still forming, we do have a history of more than 130 years of activity. And drawing on the heritage of our founding partners, we look to continue to have an impact through direct engagement and embedding practice into what we do. Our strategic plan and our vision to 2030 is built around the three pillars of people, planet, and partnership which were developed through the lens of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And those ambitions within our strategic plan align very closely with the ambitions and the mission of Walk 21. As TU Dublin, we're delighted to host Walk 21 Ireland as a national event and really look to embed uh, what we learn through the conference into our policies, culture and practice at national and local levels. I'm delighted to say that Walk 21 Ireland has brought together a body of some of the most influential people who have been working collectively for the provision and prioritisation of walking as a healthy and sustainable mode of travel. We are fortunate to have leading experts, political leaders, local practitioners, academics and community activists who will contribute to, continue to contribute to enabling and achieving the vision of better, equitable and more sustainable communities. The theme of this year's conference is the decade to change, and that tagline flags both the time-pressured criticality of what we have to achieve and the necessity to drive change. And in my mind, it creates a real opportunity to come together and figure out how we are going to create the sustainable future. However, perhaps before we consider the future, we should also look back at, at where we've come from. And 
since the first Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s, we've had almost 350 years of technological advancement. I'll put quotes around that, perhaps. Much of which has revolutionized mobility. However, when we think of all the advances made, and we consider the unique human characteristics of language, the use of tools, and the cooking of food, we come back to the most simplified, the most basic, and the most successful form of movement, bipedal upright walking, another fundamental human characteristic. So as humans, we're all built to move. Our bodies are designed and engineered and enabled to walk long distances. Our mental and physical health benefits from our freedom to move in unfettered and informal spaces, particularly through accessible, safe, and enjoyable walking environments. So the question is, how have we lost contact with that so dramatically? And as we look forward to the future possibilities of mobility, we need to reflect on the technologies and the infrastructures that form our cityscapes, realize that we've fundamentally changed the physical environment, but in doing so, we've also diminished the experience that we get from engaging with all the spaces around us. The built environment has become mechanically dominant, and through Walk 21 Ireland, we're looking to reallocate space which vehicular traffic currently uses and is currently dominant in, and to reimagine our streets and roads, designing public spaces that are for people, for all people. To increase Ireland's capacity to reverse declining trends of active and sustainable travel, education plays a key role in our transition to a more sustainable and livable environment. TU Dublin's campuses here in Grange Gorman, in Blanchardstown and Talla, on the outskirts of Dublin, act as living lab resources where the culture of inquiry, discovery and action contribute virtuously to the creation of ethical and globally responsible citizens. The Grange Gorman campus, where we are today, is a prime example of how urban regeneration can be a valuable tool in bringing the lifeblood of the city, its people, into and through a previously closed off part of the city. This Grange Gorman campus was formerly uh, a mental hospital with high walls and only one way in and one way out. Today we have eight access routes that form a link directly from the Stony Batter area through to the top of O'Connell Street, the main street in the centre of the city. There's potential to increase the permeability of not just historic institutional lands, but also looking at how we in, uh, develop recently built suburbs in our cities, towns and villages to help us meet our climate goals and to help improve the health and well-being of all our people. The benefits that Walk 21 Ireland presents in its celebration of the importance of walking will have far-reaching impacts, not just for Ireland, but we hope globally. Together, through the sharing of knowledge, the creation of new ideas and the commitment to action, this conference is playing a key role towards achieving our 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. So as our conference uh, slogan says, this is the decade to change. I wish you all a very good conference and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and on that note, the UN SDGs Partnership Goal 17, um, it just it proves time and time again that these types of events aren't possible without strong partnerships. Um, for us at TU Dublin, the partnership with Walk 21 has been such a vital component to making impactful change that demonstrates the, the closing of that gap between theory and practice to make a, a more meaningful world together. And with that, I would ask um, our partner and the CEO of Walk 21, Bronwyn Thornton, to welcome you all. Good morning. Good morning to everyone in the room and to everyone watching online. We are delighted that TU Dublin has been able to make this a hybrid event so that people from all over the world who can't travel or choose not to can join us in this vital conversation. Welcome to Walk 21 Island. I can't believe we are at Walk 2122. And uh, we'd like to particularly thank Professor Fitzpatrick, Jen Boyer, the TU Dublin team for hosting us, and of course, the national government agenda. 
because we know in this critical time that we need national governments to step up, and we're going to be hearing all about that. But it's not just now that they're stepping up. Ireland has been stepping up for the national agenda for a number of years already. And Jason King and his Get Ireland Walking team have been building momentum and um, passion for walking in this country for a number of years, and we've been talking about that. And just when we thought they couldn't do any better, they stepped in and said, OK, we'll chuck a whole lot of money at it as well in the, in the infrastructure. So we're delighted to be here in Ireland for those reasons. Uh, my own thank yous to the advisory group that supported us, to all the members of the program committee and the steering committee who have provided your insights and your intellect to the development of the program. The other critical factor here is your passion for walking. It's so lovely to come back again. In fact, I'm feeling a little emotional to be once again in a room with people who care as much about walking as we do. And to feel that three-dimension connection that we make with each other when we meet in person. And connection is what walking is all about. COVID has disconnected us. The cost of living in other global crises are challenging the connections that we feel with other people, but also creating the opportunities to, to rebuild those connections. And COVID, the connections that we, the reconnection that we get during COVID was only through walking, and now walking enables us to reconnect again. And I want you to use this conference to reconnect with your colleagues, connect with ideas, with people, build those opportunities that we know come from the synergies, those sparks that happen at being here together in person. And we get to explore Dublin in three dimensions through our workshops, through our satellite events, we can move out of Dublin and into some of the communities elsewhere in Ireland. And I hope that you will take those opportunities as well. We haven't got any more time. People talk about walking as the slow mode. We see it as the fast track to a sustainable future. And we are talking a lot about the imperative to act and that there's, it is time to do so. So with yeah, old friends, new friends, friends yet to make, I want to take a moment now to invite a long-term friend of Walk21 onto the stage. And he doesn't know this is happening. So Rob Methorst, if you would please come down and join me. And Jim is going to come up here with me as well. Because as much as we need all your new passion and your new commitment and the energy of young people, we need the long historical investment in research and commitment to walking and understanding the approach that we need. And Rob Methorst, he has written the new Bible for about walking. It's 800 pages, it weighs a lot, but he's got some here for you. And we wanted, at this moment, people who've been before, we know we recognize people randomly at Walk21, but he is committed to walking, he's researched it, he's brought groups together from all across Europe, and we want to take this moment to acknowledge that and to thank Rob for his efforts and commitment. Yeah. Oh, I'm absolutely flabbergasted. This, <laughs> uh -huh, that I uh, you get emotional by this. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you very much That's for okay. doing this. Thank you. So let's build on his wisdom, on our shared knowledge and understanding, and take our passion forward with us through the next few days. And please, don't hesitate to approach any of us. Enjoy yourselves. Ask us if you want to meet someone. If you see their name, please ask us to introduce you. Thank you very much, and welcome to Walk 21. Thank you, Brahman. Um, and I, I suppose just to reiterate, um, you know, we are at a really important moment in time. It is one of those first opportunities for people to come together again in a shared space. Um, and I think we're going to try and make the most of the opportunities to recognize things that have happened which haven't gotten the prominence maybe over the last number of years that they could, or take the opportunity to make connections um, and promote various initiatives while we're here during the conference. Um, so we're very agile, and I suppose the team has been working very agile over the last 12 months in planning the conference, so I think at this stage we're pretty much ready for anything. Um, 
So on that basis, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Lake Sigaris, is going to talk to us about the academic approach. So thinking about where we've been uh, and also, I suppose, framing the context for where we need to go. Keeping in mind that time pressure that we have around the urgency to make our world more sustainable. Uh, Lake is going to offer us a global perspective on the academic study of walking. She's a professor of planning and community development in the Department of Transport and Engineering at Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile. She is an internationally recognized expert on cycling, cycle inclusive urban planning, civil society development, and participatory planning theory and practice as they relate to urban regional governments. And that's what we're talking about today. She works in a cross disciplinary and university community government collaboration framework of participatory action research. This is the type of research I think we all can see the value of uh, and the future for, and it requires ongoing partnerships to deepen uh, where we need to get to. She has over 20 years of innovation and urban planning in Chile, uh, in experience in Chile and elsewhere. She's an award-winning writer and editor. I had the pleasure of being a part of a workshop with her yesterday in VREF. Uh, she has an awful lot to offer. So, Dr. Sigaris, we, we welcome you here today. Hello. So, do we have some slides, and is everything going to work? We do. Yes. Okay. Well, I just wanted to start by saying a big thank you to the conference organizers, especially to Aideen, who's actually the person who's responsible for me being here. It's really exciting to be here. It was extremely difficult, especially when I went and broke my knee, uh, which required a lot of adjustments to the travel arrangements. But walking has helped me recover quite a bit. So anyway, so this presentation is a bit of an overview. It would be. Uh, Oops, do we have progress here? No? Perhaps the batteries have run down here? Ah, something happened. It's taking a long time though. Hmm. Any help from the techies? Yes? Okay, so uh, I hope this will be reasonably rapid the transitions, because I usually show my slides a bit more like a movie than, than a lengthy thing for reading. You've got a new one. Thank you very much. I'm sure that will help. There you go. Yes. OK. So yes, participatory action research is what we do in our laboratory for social change in uh, Chile, Santiago, and Temuco. And um, one of the things about this research that may not be familiar to everyone is that one of the things we really focus on is not just describing reality the way a lot of wonderful research does and helping us to understand it better, but also testing ways of changing that reality. And so we're very, very focused on what are the kinds of factors that make change possible. And today our invitation is really to learn to innovate together by looking at issues of safety, security, violence, the way they play out on our roads, the way they damage our communities. And we think that both a gender perspective and walking are particularly powerful uh, levers of change in that sense. So, of course, we're all very inspired by these sustainable development goals. And being an urban regional planner, I have to say that, well, but I think they all begin and end in cities. Come on, large and small, if we're going to fight poverty, if we're going to apply a gender perspective, if we're going to build world peace, we need to build peaceful cities. And we'll talk about that a little more. And um, I really like the university slogan of uh, people, planet, and partnerships, because I think that really captures the essence of social sustainability which is something that we have studied uh, as part of our groundwork for our work in, in Chile. And we really realized when we did this that human rights, democratization, and related issues are really, really central to social sustainability. We can't really talk about sustainability uh, in a full and effective way if we don't consider equity and so on. 
and we work with a permanent community of partners, uh, local governments, regional governments, community organizations, activist organizations, and we mix both our, our teaching and our research using this partnership. So we're also very inspired by um, work on transport and health. It, health is the planet in our bodies. Uh, and so it's a really central key to moving ahead. And of course, we experience our bodies and we experience health most fully by walking, most universally by walking. There's a lot of other ways of doing it, but walking is the thing that we have for everyone. And I'll come back to this in a minute, but one of the most interesting things about this Lancet article on health and transportation and cities is this idea that we need to experiment with projects in order to really understand how to, how to transition. So what's happening with science and walking? Yeah, and and uh, I'm really here to learn from all of you. I, I don't feel like I have the uh, bottom line on everything that's happening. But I did have the privilege last year of doing this study or working on this study with VREF on walking and sort of discovered it as the invisible transport mode. Worked with people from Europe, from Latin America, from Africa as well. Very important because Latin America and Africa, there's a lot of walking. We did participatory workshops online in Spanish and also in English, which was extremely rich in terms of generating a better idea of what's going on. And we also, because of this, we were able to develop this very global framework of sort of global north, global south, what does this tell us, and escape a little bit from the overwhelming dominance of, um, of views from the global north which really dominate research, and that came out very strongly in this project. So uh, one of the really central things about this was finding that uh, Global South cities where people walk the most are also the most unequal. And people who walk the most are the people who experience the most exclusion uh, and particularly political exclusion. Because if you can be involved in politics in some significant way, you can start to change your reality. But when you're excluded from political participation as active citizens, then it's very difficult to change things. And we think that that's something really, really important for walking. Even in thinking about health, most of the literature, in sci in scientific literature on transport and health, when it looks at walking or cycling or active transport, it looks at it as if it's about physical activity, getting people out of their cars. And indeed, yes, when you have very high modal shares for cars, as you do in many cities in the global north, then yeah, you've got, that's a good perspective. But if the issue is equity and social inclusion and you have streets that are covered with cars but very few people actually own cars, of course some very privileged families have up to five cars per household as occurs in Santiago, then it's a very different kind of issue. And we think that we really see that with walking. So we did this bibliometric search, which uh, uses a lot of algorithms and, and software, different kinds of software, to look at what's going on with research on walking. And we thought, wow, look at this. Isn't this great? There's so much more research on walking nowadays. But actually, when we compared it, the upper line is general research on transport, and the bottom line is research on walking. We can see that actually walking has lagged a little behind, although we have made great strides in research. But it is very hard to find. It's often between the lines. I scanned abstract after abstract, and, and you know, I was looking for just one mention of walking related to transit-oriented demand or public transport or uh, any number of things. And sometimes they would even talk about paths, pedestrian paths or air pollution, but they weren't talking about walking itself as a phenomenon. So lots of social science studies, lots of engineering, health, et cetera, are the disciplines. We looked at these clusters and links, which were really interesting. One of the most shocking things about that, though, was how generic the terms used. The author's keywords are much more precise, but the generic terms which the system itself uses to sort through articles and, and, and give them to you when you're doing a search are very, very genetic. So human, female, male, uh, article, uh, adult, aged, safety, 
uh, way too generic for, for our taste. And where we did find huge mentions uh, of walking was, uh, and these are in order, so neighborhoods, children walking, policy, public transport, but you can see it goes way, just plunges the numbers. And so with gender, for example, we have very few mentions compared to other areas. And yet women are walking way more than men and poor women are walking way more than anyone else. And that has a huge impact on social justice and inclusion. When we looked at research around the world as well, you can see how the United States is really dominating Canada, some Asia, uh, Australia, thanks to really groundbreaking work by a group of Australian researchers, especially Billy Giles Corti and, and others like her. Uh, but rather sad that countries where up to 80% of daily trips may be done by walking are the ones generating the least research, so, or, or at least publishing in these index journals. And when we look at research collaborations as well, what we find, what these lines show is how these lines from basically the power, research powerhouses of North America and Europe, they leap across, they mostly leap across the global south, Africa and Latin America and even Asia. And, and, and so researchers talk to other researchers with very similar social and urban conditions, very high dominance of car mobility, which really means that um, you get all kinds of distortions. But above all, you would think that it would be really important to learn about walking from places where people walk the most. So that it's not a matter of just getting people out of cars, it's a matter of how do we preserve and, and continue to build on this heritage mobility mode of walking, which is the most ancient transport mode of all. So we also did, took a look at some of the leading authors. And at first, it was kind of obvious. A lot of people who, are, who do research will know, you know, uh, James Salis or Larry Frank or, or, uh, and so on. So it's kind of logical when you look at the global picture. And it seems pretty, um, pretty fair or pretty, pretty representative of what we have. But when we looked at results from Africa, where there is some very interesting research coming out. It's, it's their pioneers who are doing it and so on, but they didn't come up in the bibliometric search. So these systems for automatic searches or in-depth or highly quantitative searches somehow are repeating a lot of the discrimination that we're seeing so that the main people who are doing research or the publications we were able to find yeah, are not even on this list. So uh, it's really important to think across this. I'm not going to read all the trends and gaps. This study is on the VREF website. You're, you're welcome. Indeed, we would love it if you would read it and give us feedback on it and so on. But just a couple of points is that um, walking is really a between the lines kind of thing. And changing, and, and I mean, on one hand, if you're a critical thinker, you feel, well, maybe that's a good thing, but it's not always a good thing. No, it's, all, it, it's a very bad thing in these conditions and so on. So how do we change that with our research and with our actions? There are also some very practical problems. So open access, for example, which sounds wonderful. Uh, uh, it's great. It means researchers in the Global South can access articles, mostly from the Global North, but if we have to pay to publish, then we can't. Huh? We don't have those kinds of funding. And the other thing is what we find, especially in Latin America, where we mostly speak Spanish and Portuguese, is that we're required to publish in top-ranking journals. And they're all in English. And since our populations are not bilingual, or if they're bilingual, it's Spanish and an indigenous language, then we're actually in a very difficult position where we're almost stealing knowledge from our communities and from our, our places and our people and our policymakers, and we're not being able to return it very effectively. So these are challenges that we face. And I'd just like to take a minute to say something, one of the really important conclusions for us about this has been that um, we really should ta stop talking about women being afraid 
Yeah, in fact, I was surprised how many of the comments here were about, oh, I'd love to walk, but I'm afraid it, it's difficult because of the dark or because of harassment or whatever. That, that's not a problem of fear among the victims of it. It's, this is a problem of violence and the way social violence plays out on our streets. We studied this very, very centrally. We did a transport justice report, balance sheet, and we translated into our Chilean, our Latin American reality, transport justice con concepts that have started mostly in, in the Netherlands and some of the northern universities in Europe. And we did it from a gender perspective as well. And it was really clear that uh, this is violence, huh? And that uh, we need to think a lot more about why these, how this violence plays out on our streets and how walking could help us to overcome these kinds of violence uh, by making not just uh, safe sidewalks, but safe spaces where everyone can walk freely and can interact freely without having to worry about violence or harassment or risk. So this is the last part of my presentation. I've got a few minutes left. And I just want to say that uh, coming back to this observation from the Lancet article, which I mentioned at the start, the need to focus on experimentation through projects. Many of you who are advocates, who are in civil society organizations, are actively involved in experimentation every day. You're incredibly creative, you're incredibly active, you always find a way no matter what the barriers are and so on but we need to harvest the lessons from those experiments to really get the most out of them. And that is where university community alliances become particularly important. And I was very surprised a couple of weeks ago when we had a visitor from Berlin, the Technical University of Berlin in Santiago, and she was tell telling about the practical experiments that they were doing in city neighborhoods with city neighborhood organizations. So you're not, so we don't experiment on people, we experiment with people in very horizontal relationships. So it's quite a radical shift from the objective university uh, an investigator who comes in and stares at you like a bug under their microscope and then goes away and uses your knowledge for their own pursuits and doesn't necessarily acknowledge where that came from. So we really need to change this kind of um, research paradigm and move on from it. And just to give a sense of where that has been taking us, uh, our theory of change right now that we've just been developing over the last few months as a result of these first eight years, 10 years of research in our lab is the importance of recognizing and understanding violence as what it is. And it's a great many things, undoubtedly, but it is mainly a form of social control. And it's mainly a form of, of maintaining subordination. So walking, when it's ignored in policy planning, is a form of maintaining walking as a subordinate mode and maintaining automobility, which is not just a form of transportation, but an ideology. This is John Urey and Mimi Scheller and Jorge Beckman's work, wonderful work on automobility as an ideology and not just as an urban transport phenomenon. It's very important to keep in mind. It, violence correlates really deeply with inequality. So it's not just an accident or an oversight that people who walk in, in Nairobi, for example, have very few walking facilities, even though most people walk for their trips. They're low-income people, and they're just not considered be in very unequal societies. So the upside of this is that we think that actually, if you look at the history, uh, I, I know walking advocates don't like looking at cycling too much, but there is a history there that we can spell out and study. If you look at the history of cycling movements and cycle inclusion in the Netherlands, what you can see is how it played a really major role in democratizing urban planning. And that gets forgotten, right? Everyone goes and looks at all the infrastructure and says, oh, wow, I want one of those and one of those and one of those. And they put it in their shopping cart and take it home and try and build it. Uh, but actually, what was really important about the Dutch experience was how social movements shifted 
cycling from a very marginal, much more marginal than walking, for heaven's sakes, and brought it into the center of urban planning. So it's interesting to think about how doing something similar with walking could really help to democratize not just planning, but social and political relationships in these very unequal societies. So we've looked a lot at gender. I think gender is central. Uh, high levels of violence against women on our roads, in our public spaces, limit their ability to participate in the workforce. Despite the fact we Chileans think we're incredibly sophisticated and well-educated, we actually have very low participation of women in the, in the workforce. There's a lot of tension between sustainability, walk, bike, bus, transport, and equity. So the people who walk the most, the people who take the most public transport, are women and they're low-income people. So we need to think about that. It it's often plays out spatially, so you end up with the best walking facilities in the wealthiest part of the city, where people walk the least, uh, or maybe don't walk for transport, but walk for pleasure, but it's not the same uh, as sort of a more equity-related thing. So there's a lot of consequences for this when we talk about equity, equality, freedom. There's a lot of different definitions. I don't think we have to settle for just one because different definitions work for different people in different contexts. But one of the most surpri surprising things that we found was that this idea about violence on our streets is perceived by people. It's not just a theoretical construct. So we did a survey for our transport report and we found that, that 20 to 25% of people in, in two diff very different cities felt that going out their door and interacting on the road was participating in a war. And that actually that's true, there's a very high risk of dying <laughs> or being seriously uh, uh, handicapped as a result. But interestingly, no one felt like a winner in this, not even drivers, we thought drivers would feel like winners. And uh-oh, uh now we have a problem, Houston. Uh, drivers identify way more with walkers than cyclists do. So why do we always group walkers and cyclists together? Maybe we're making a mistake. Maybe we're losing a huge opportunity. So um, in these last few moments, um, just looking at heritage was also uh, a major thing a major issue, and heritage doesn't really appear in transport justice studies from the global north, but it is very important. So dialogue between theory and action, you can't have good theory without good actions, and you can't have a good action, a good strategy uh, without good theory, so they need to talk back and forth all the time. Women gender audits on streets are really good. We developed uh, what we thought was a safe routes to school program, global north. Uh, Students from a very low income uh, area said, no, 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 we want cool routes to school, thank you very much. And so we got involved in gender and art and a whole lot of other things. During the pandemic, we started doing these in public squares and in communities and online. And what we discovered was that older adults weren't coming out. So we developed a cycle taxi based on a Danish pattern and started getting our elderly people out. So. We've been innovating in citizen participation, leading our own citizen-led urban planning. This is the Bella Vista uh, community in central Santiago. We thought we were doing this for health. Uh-uh, uh-uh. When all the debates and all the chats and all the questioning and all the uh, uh, discussions were over with, it was for security. Getting rid of parking, limiting cars, driving through neighborhoods, was li limits drive-by shootings, limits the informal parkers who come armed with knives nowadays and threaten people and work for the drug bans that are trying to take over our neighborhood. So these opportunities that we learn in these living laboratories are very important. And we're currently training people, opening up ideas about this, and this would be the last thought that I would really like to leave with you is because I think in road safety, we commit a lot of the same mistakes as we're often committed with women and rape. We blame the victim. Say, oh, why were you walking there? Why were you crossing there? Why were you dressed like that? No one could see you, etc. 
But it's really, it's not about training people or teaching people to adapt to a dysfunctional and unjust system. We really need to teach them to change the system. And that's where we're at with our experimentation. So we do this on all kinds of different scales, concepts. We take it into public policies. And we also do scientific publications because that's very important for our, many of our employers or bosses. And I'll just say thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sigaris. That was uh, truly inspirational. Um, I think the, the need to change our reality and not accept what is here um, throws up so many wonderful questions. Um, I know we were hoping to have time for Q&A, but I think in the interest of hearing from all our speakers, we're going to keep going. And I would ask you to, to talk with Dr. Sigaris after this. I know I have a few questions. Um, I think the whole idea of return on research measured through publications is a real challenge in terms of making it a livable, uh, tangible thing in, in everybody's lives. So uh, thank you for that. Our next speaker this morning is Mr. Robert Thaler, and he is going to offer us an update and some fresh thinking from the pan-European discussions that are taking place in parallel with this conference. Mr. Thaler is the head of the Division of Active Mobility and Mobility Management at the Austrian Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. That's quite a ministry. Uh, he is vice chair of the UN ECE WHO Transport Health Environmental Pan-European Program, the PEP. Uh, he leads several PEP partnerships and is president of the EU platform on mobility management. He has a leading role and engagement in the EU in international negotiations, development and implementation strategies, programs, declarations, guidelines, and conferences in the field of transport, health, and environment. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Robert Thaler. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, warm thanks from the UNEC WHO program, Transport Health Environment, on a pan-European scale to the hosts. I'm very impressed about this conference, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. And thanks to the Irish colleagues and to the team here in the campus. I, I, rec I recognize the, uh, that walking has um, much more to do uh, with, tr with transport and psychology and mental health and physical health. Um, and you mentioned car is an ideology and walking is just a natural disaster sometimes if you look our cities. Um, we all, and the, in fact it's all about us because we are the walkers. We are uh, walking. I enjoyed walking coming here to this uh, wonderful place. I enjoyed a uh, nice new tram line. I enjoyed 80 centimeter sidewalk congestion, uh, garbage litter boxes on the sidewalk, uh, traffic signs, and then he coming here, a nice road pedestrianized for cyclists and walkers. So you can see in one city you experience everything. And um, good solutions, bad solutions. And you can find this all over the world. Um, and the PEP, or the Transport Health Environment Pan-European Program, wants now to close this gap between this patchwork in the cities, between the patchwork of countries, and make active mobility a mainstream. Um, it's not about the uh, walking is sometimes seen as uh, already was pointed out as a, an animal on the red list of outdying species. Because if you look at the statistics, walking decreased, 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 um, car has increased, cycling is increasing, cycling is very fashionable, but walking, uh, nobody, can, nobody is aware to be a walker, but everybody walks. It's a bit a bit a psychological dilemma we are in, because all the car drivers are walkers, and cyclists are walkers, and if you go by public transport, you all, every trip stops, starts with a step. And if you look at our transport statistics, these are pure lying. The transport statistics don't tell you the truth. They just say a trip is from door to door a walking trip, but not the trip to the bus, not the trip to the cyclist, not the trip to the car is calculated. So it gives you totally wrong uh, impression. And 
Stakeholders always look at figures. Ah, walking is only 15%. Car is 50%. It's much more important. So we have to change a lot of the perception also in policy making and in transport planning and in city planning. So it's not only about the cities. It's about also a supportive framework, how we support the cities in walking. And the PEP is a unique exercise. I hope there is the presentation somewhere, lost in space. Should be here. Yeah. I was so fast. Okay. Um, the PEP is a unique exercise. The PEP is an example where ministries of different sectors are working together. It's not, a, it's not usual, I have to say. It has a long history, 20 years of history of learning from each other. Transport people have a different language. There's health people. Health people have a different language than environment people, and so on and so on. And the most important thing to have these changes, which is in the title, happening is to get out of the silos. I'm a transport planner. I'm health doctor. I'm just urban specialist. We have to sit together and find holistic solutions and not just make technology and not just make infrastructure and not just make some awareness raising. No, we have the things to put together because what we want to achieve is getting out of this patchwork and find a new perfect picture, a mainstream or a new picture of active mobility in the whole region. And the region here is a UN, EC, WHO region, 56 countries. It's the north, so it's not the south. It, this time it's the north. But I think it's also important that the north starts to thinking that it's not just the automobile which is fashionable. It's the shoes which are fashionable or the clothes, because this is the, bo the car body, you know, is our clothes. And the tires are the shoes. So we have to, to, we have to be aware that uh, it's not the glance of the metal, it's also how we perform on a nice place and how we want to be seen or how we want to see the others. So it's a very, very important topic to bring this on a European scale out of the trap of subsidiarity. Because I know this de debate for decades, if you talk with uh, European people, several on, on, on European level, they all, or international level, they say, no, 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 it's, we, we talk about uh, airports, we talk about uh, rails, railways, we talk about motorways, but walking is for cities, it's not for us. And this is the wrong attitude and we want to change that because the cities need a supportive framework. And this is a historic milestone that was last year, we started the PEP decade for change, so very similar to, to Walk 21. Um, because active mobility should be in the core of policy in the future. And uh, in Vienna, 46 ministers gathered online and adopted the Vienna Declaration of the, let's say, the Austrian Environment Minister and the Austrian Health Minister and myself in the middle. Um, this historic document is called Vienna Ministerial Declaration, building forward better, no, not build back better, as some people say. No, we want to build forward better and don't fall into old traps. Uh, and this is by transforming our mobility system to new, clean, safe, healthy, and inclusive mobility, and clean mobility. And this ministerial declaration really did a change, because for the first time, and this is really a historic, was a historic moment, for the first time, the ministers adopted the first pan-European strategy on cycling, the master plan on cycling in Europe whole Europe, from Vancouver to Vladivostok at that time. And the ministers decided also to extend the scope of this plan to the whole range of active mobility. And the ministers decided and adopted objectives that we have to significantly increase, not only cycling, but also walking. So it's the, the change of the trend and the, increase the safety and establish master plans on the national level as a supportive framework for the cities, for example, and build and extend appropriate infrastructure. And of course, last but not least, change our land use planning from a car-oriented planning to a pedestrianized planning. And this was adopted, and this is now a mandate. It's a strong mandate for the next years to work on this specific extension of the cycling master plan to a walking master plan. So we are now in the phase, we had first meeting, we started already actions after this uh, 
um, uh, gathering the countries which are interested. It's around 10 countries which are now starting the point. It was in the, in the cycling issue. We started with seven countries, ended up with 30 countries involved. And we had several meetings, the first one in Vienna, last one in Paris, and uh, the next one here in uh, Dublin on Friday. And what is now this master plan on walking all about? We have to put together our forces to pull out walking from this niche. It's a, it should be a mainstream. So that's the, the mo most important thing. And you know, cycling is one thing. And I was <laughs> very wondering that cycling and walkers are sometimes uh, not only coalitionists, but <laughs> also fight on space. You can see that. Uh, and that together forms the whole active mobility uh, agenda. Now, what, what should be the major part of this? Uh, what we are aiming at? We are aiming at objectives of in, the, in the whole region, which is not easy for the whole region because we have a big variety of countries. We, have, uh, we try to, to find out the status and the challenges. It's not so easy because the data gaps are enormous sometimes. And of course, one important thing is the benefits, to make it clear that walking is beneficial for everybody, for personally, as is my fitness, but also for the economics, because this, you know shopping streets are heavily depending on walkers, and every bazaar is based on walkers, and even a shopping center somewhere outside is a, a rebuilding of a bazaar, in fact, with places, small streets, narrow streets, so that you have to stand something and stand still and then you look at the window and then you go shopping. With a car, it's not possible. So walking is a basic of city economics. And it's, of course, of, for health, classical, but also very, very important for the whole social life in the city. And this, I, was, I think this was stressed by my previous speakers. And um, the most important thing of the whole plan are policy recommendations, recommendations to act for the countries and for the ministers to be responsible. Um, so that are the objectives we are now discussing. Significantly increase walking in every country, in every country. Significantly increase the safety. So the vision is zero, no killed pedestrian. I mean, that is, I mean, the obvious ob objective. The extension of the infrastructure, so not one meter, two and a half or three of a boulevard full of trees because we have to adapt also to climate change. We need a lot of trees and a green spaces also for the pedestrians in the, in the cities, but also for our adaptation to climate change on the heat waves. And we need national walking policies and national walking strategies because if it's not recognized on a national level, it's not important. And we need also a pan-European strategy on the EU level, but also here what we are elaborating in the PEP. This is important as the framework for ACT. And uh, of course, the combination of walking needs, or the, 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 the progress or the, the push for walking needs also the combination of health policies, transport policies, and land use policies. I think that's very, very important. We are now in the phase of elaborating this plan. We are uh, 10 or more than 10 countries already, and we are hoping that we will finally negotiate it and hopefully adopt it also at the sixth high-level ministerial meeting by the ministers 2025. So that's the story, and I have to invite you, if you are representatives, if there are rep representatives from member states or for countries here or for cities, please join this partnership. Welcome to this partnership on active mobility. We have a meeting on Friday, after, just right after the conference here. Um, we're in the Greenway building, get in contact with me if you are interested. We are looking for uh, interested and committed member states, and it's also some, some very important, it's a, it's a give and take because, uh, okay, we, we want to, to show you that you also can, we will also facilitate your efforts on national level within this transport, health, environment, pan-European program. So we hope that we can really contribute to this decade of change making walking, I think, uh, as a fundamental mobility form uh, accepted everywhere. And not just for robots in the future, but for humans in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thauer. That was, um, that was 
amazing because we, you know, we've heard about the role of experimentation, but equally the need for roadmaps and blueprints at a high level that people can understand, that countries and cities can adopt where there are priorities and objectives that are set where there is agreement for how to prioritize walking for all of the reasons you mentioned. And I think it's wonderful to see that balance and that need for experimentation within guidelines, within, within a working scope to realize it. So that's our global perspective uh, on walking. And we're going to turn now and we're going to look at Ireland's story uh, and the Irish perspective on walking. Our next uh, speaker and also one of our funding partners for the conference, a local advocate and supporter for change is Dr. Una May the Chief Executive Officer of Sport Ireland. Dr. May was appointed CEO in January 2022 and has worked with Sport Ireland previously since 1998. Prior to her appointment as CEO, she was Director of Participation and Ethics and also held the role as Director of Anti-Doping, leading to the creation of a world-class, globally recognized anti-doping program. She has a PhD in exercise physiology and a BSc in sciences from Johns Moore University in Liverpool. Dr. Una May is passionate about the power of sport and physical activity to improve the lives of people and communities. Dr. May, you're very welcome. Okay, well, um, that introduction, I suppose, starts me off quite well because I, I'm sure some of you are wondering why Sport Ireland in particular is involved with this initiative. Um, and we in Sport Ireland have been passionate about walking as a, what we would refer to really, and, and the anti-doping bit kind of gives a bit of a hint here, a gateway drug into greater levels of physical activity and also sport. So we have a vested interest in sport or in, in walking as, as a way of encouraging people to be active enough to be able to take up sport, but also for itself and the importance that um, uh, walking presents for physical activity. So a lot of the theme of this conference, and I know it, it, it's, it's clear from what we've spoken so far, but uh, thankfully Robert has given me a little in, intro there around the, the va value of sport for health, not just for sustainable transport and climate action. And, and sport can contribute a huge amount to the, the achievement of the sustainable development goals, um, you know, as I say, through walking as well as sport. And, Sport Ireland has been, as I said, we've been involved in this area and I just wanted to, th to thank um, Professor Fitzpatrick and TUD for bringing us here but also for minding Lorraine for us because you may not know that Lorraine was previously a member of our team in Sport Ireland. So she left a legacy of, of commitment to walking and physical activity um, within the organisation which we, we hopefully continue to maintain. Um, we, we run a number of programmes um, in Sport Ireland, but particularly my role today is to talk about the Get Ireland Walking Programme, and I do feel a bit of a fraud because I'm not the leader of this programme. Jason King has committed, I would say, committed his life to the Get Ireland Walking Programme, and we are eternally grateful to Jason for his work in this programme, and I will thank some others. But um, just to go back to the, the relevance of walking for health, Sport Ireland carried out some research recently, um, it, it was published last year, around um, the value of physical activity. And our research, um, previous research found, not our research, but previous research found that um, physical inactivity in Ireland causes approximately 4,000 deaths a year in Ireland. Now, if we were looking at that from any other perspective, we'd be we'd be worried and panicking about what we're going to do about this. But we see it as a huge um, goal for us. We also see that, and, and through our research, we look, looked at the economic value of sport and physical activity, that the cost to um, the healthcare system of physical inactivity is approximately 1.5 billion euros in Ireland per year. So physical activity is really, really important to us from a health perspective, as well as from the, the values that are seen, and as I said, are, are kind of fundamental to this program around this, this conference around sustainability. Sport Ireland has a role in um, primarily recreational activity and in addition to the program that I'm going to talk about today, the Get Ireland Walking, is just to mention that, that since our inception 
um, as the Sports Council back in 1999, we, um, we led out on the National Trails Register. So Sport Ireland is responsible for the maintenance and um, hosting of a National Trails Register, which has over 9, 900 trails across Ireland on this register. Um, we also provide guidance on, on management, maintenance, development of recreational trails. So we, 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 we are primarily about you know, I suppose sport in its purest sense, but we have a very involved role around walking. So we started around the trails and then more recently, so in the past 10 years, we developed this program called Get Ireland Walking, which has been designed to help increase physical activity and particularly looking at our harder to reach population, particularly the inactive population where we realise that this is where the, the, the gateway comes in. We need to get the inactive active and walking is the easiest way to get the inactive active. So it's a really fundamental form of exercise for us. But what we have identified is the need through this programme to target the whole population. And each aspect of the population has slightly different needs and slightly different focuses and um, slightly different kind of challenges to being active. So we focus programmes on young people, families, middle-aged, those in their mature years, and all of our interventions kind of cross over into all those different areas. Now I'm going to check this. Oh, great. So, um, so the Get Ireland Walking is a national in initiative. It's an it's initiative of Sport Ireland, but it's heavily supported by Healthy Ireland, and it's delivered by Mountaineering Ireland. And this is really important from our point of view to promote um, st the stability of the programme and the sustainability of the programme, because you can have great initiatives, but if you don't have a... If you just set up a, a committee or something, it mightn't last. So by, by embedding this into Mountaineering Ireland, we believe that this has been a very sustainable model, and we were, again, grateful to Mountaineering Ireland Ireland for hosting this program and they've been very supportive and, and I just want to thank the board of Mountaineering Ireland for their support as well as the executive of, of Mountaineering Ireland. So the Get Ireland Walking program was established in 2013 um, to encourage widespread participation in walking, promote the benefits of walking, to unify and enable the efforts of all the organisations and agencies who are interested in promoting walking for recreation, transport and health. And I've been talking to Joe, who's going to be on next after me, and we've agreed there is a massive a multitude of um, national policies, strategies, frameworks, where walking is, overlaps in a huge number of areas. And, and I, I think that one of the really important, um, I suppose, opportunities that being um, Based, having the Get Ireland Walking program based in a slightly objective entity, we don't build infrastructure generally, we don't do a lot of that, but it puts us in an objective position to be a very strong partner kind of facilitator, and that's something that we consider to be an important part of our role. Um, when um, we established the programme, we had one employee. We now have an annual budget of approximately 300,000 a year and four staff, including three full-time staff and another member hired in partnership through our local sports partnership network. And they've been a very important partner in this and that will appear later. We, we run several national programmes. We, the Royal We, I keep feeling guilty when I say we because Jason runs several national programmes with his team. Um, we also have a steering group which, which just, I suppose, monitors and ensures that the programme is, is following the, the, the key, uh, I suppose, objectives that were set out for it. Um, that steering group um, is made up of the, the key funders of the programme. And the funding has been really important in order to maintain the programme. And since its inception in 2013, approximately one and a half million euros has been invested across a number of different funding opportunities, funding through Healthy Ireland, through um, Dormant Accounts Social Inclusion Fund, through Sport Ireland Core Funding. So we, we've been steadily increasing the investment in the programme over the years, and, and that has helped it to become more successful. In 2017, we, we launched our first um, Get Ireland Walking strategy. And what we did there was we, we, we saw a shift from a project-based initiative. So we initially set up a project, let's, let's run this Get Ireland Walking project. Through, and it supported in particular an active community walking program through our local sports partnership network. But um, we, in the new strategy, we've grown and you know, expanded the program. So in that strategy in 2017, there were 20 agreed shared actions. And shared is the key word here because it's one of the most important parts of everything we do in Sport Ireland. We're a relatively small state agency. 
but our value is in our work in partnership with others. So we connect in with people who, um, I suppose, have the support and who have the, the mechanisms for connecting in with the populations we're trying to target, with the other organisations and agencies who can facilitate the activation of what we try to do. So our role is really activation, um, and, and that's very important to us. So the, the 20 agreed actions ranged from new programmes, development of resources and toolkits, that's something else we, we're very big believers in empowering and building capacity around us because we can't do everything ourselves. Although I'm proud that we have four people now working on the programme, it's still very small to transform walking in Ireland. Um, but our key is, is to work with partners and to build capacity through the development of resources and toolkits. Um, we, we obviously have a, a role to play in national and international conferences. We do a lot of work around networking, collaboration kind of projects, um, a lot of strategic planning through local and national working groups. Um, very important to us is the area of research and development, so it was interesting to hear Lake's presentation there. Um, we've moved a lot of our work, not just into traditional academic research, but down into monitoring and evaluation. And that's really important for us because we can have all the numbers in the world, but we need to know, are these numbers actually making a difference and are they affecting change? So that's important for us. Um, and then one of the more important areas for us is communications. And it's something that's always traditionally been low on the, the priority list, spending money on PR and all that sort of glossy things, branding and everything. But in actual fact, it seems to us that it's one of the most important keys to accessing our communities and to making a difference is communication. We have to be committed to, to, to investing in this area. So on the slide there, you'll see the key themes, seven key themes delivered through this strategy. Number one is actually public awareness, education and communication. Um, the second one is around children and young people, um, and this relates to our, our partnership with our active schools program in Ireland. Um, also health, environment, I don't know if you can read these actually, um, environment, communities, um, research monitoring and evaluation, and then as I've mentioned before, partnerships. So partnerships will always appear in everything we do because it is really so important to, to achieving what we're trying to set out to achieve. We also have the steering group, as I mentioned, and um, that, that steering group ensures that we maintain our strategic focus and also, of course, the important element of resources. So the, the steering group is made up of those who, who resource this programme and who promote it through, through those resources as well. Um, so as I mentioned, research and evaluation are important parts of what we do. So we have a research unit in Sport Ireland and every second year we, we run an Irish Sports Monitor, which is our primary sports participation research tool. It's a very lengthy um, public, um, I suppose, market research, you know, um, phone survey to the entire population of Ireland. Um, so it's very important for us, it monitors and measures how many people are doing all kinds of different activities. We, we overlay that with demographic information, with um, geographic location, with all kinds of uh, different elements. So as part of this research, we've been monitoring and um, recreational walking as part of this. And recreational walking is defined by us as taking part in walking for recreation in the previous week. So it, that's how, and, and this is a difficult area with research because different people define things differently. So it's important to recognize that's our measure. But recreational walking rose from 60, just under 64% in 2011 to this peak you can see here during the pandemic of 76%. It has dropped back down to 71% by the end of 2021, but it's still significantly higher than it was in 2011. So we are seeing a, a steady improvement in the, the rates of walking, which is really positive, and we're, we're very happy to see it. Um, I suppose it's been mentioned before, some of the areas um, around walking for transport. We do actually record walking for transport as part of our research, um, which you know, shows us kind of useful background information as well. It helps us to kind of collaborate between, or correlate between the information we're getting for recreational walking and walking for transport. So obviously, despite the number of people being reduced, the number of people traveling was reduced during the pandemic. Actually, the highest figures of walking for transport happened during the pandemic. And of course, we can all speculate that that was probably due to the fact that people were afraid to use public transport. So whatever the reasons, the reality is there was that increase in walking for transport. And we really want to ensure that we actually you know, maintain some of that if we can. And I think that's something we all need to be striving towards. Um, 
I said it's research and evaluation, so we also have carried out an evaluation of the Get Ireland Walking um, study now. It is literally, it is, I won't even say hot off the press, I think it's still sitting in the press, actually. So uh, there's still steam coming off it, so we haven't published it yet, but um, we are very happy with the outcome and, and, and we've carried out a full process and outcome evaluation of the programme covering the, the, the initial period of 2015 to 2021. So the, the, the outcomes and the, the, the the, the, the findings are very positive and, and we've, we've, I suppose we've reached our targets in a pretty much every area we've tried to affect change, we've seen improvements. So it's very positive and we will continue to support the programme and we're very happy to continue to support it. Um, some of the key areas, and I mentioned communication, are around the reach and awareness. And it's something we find with all the programmes we run in Sport Ireland, that our challenge is making sure people know that these are available to us. And it's a bit like the thing about the, the, the affluent areas having the nicer walking areas. It's the people from lower socioeconomic groups who don't have access to the information, who don't know these programmes are there. And our actual, many of our programmes are targeted at people from disadvantaged communities, and yet we're not reaching those communities. You know, we have good numbers and it's nice to say we have lots of people being active, but we know that in actual fact, the majority of the act, not the majority, but there are significantly more people who are in the higher socioeconomic groups are the active part of the population. So communicating to people is really important and we've done a lot of work around, I suppose, small research focus groups to find out how we reach those target groups, you know, and what are the keys. So, you know, we're currently running a program for physical activity for men over 45. How do we reach the men over 45? There's no point targeting them through certain radio programs or certain TV adverts or, you know, we need to find out exactly how we reach these people. So that's reach and awareness is very important for us and is behind a lot of our work these days. I've mentioned partnership before, that, that we've, we've looked at how well the targeted organisations and partners were engaged locally and nationally, and we can see some really, really good findings. The schools information has been very interesting. And it was interesting when you mentioned about the cool walks to school, because um, actually what, what, I won't go so far as to say that the walking programme was rated as cool, we didn't have that as a measure, but what we did find is that the attitudes to walking were much more positive following our schools walking programme, and it's a simple programme we, we provide toolkits for schools to put a, a little marked route around their school with a little walking route around their school and it connects in. The important thing is it connects in with the Active Schools programme. So once again, it's about that connection. But as well as the children finding it more, um, have, having a, a, a more positive attitude to walking, the teachers have also had a more positive attitude, so that's really helpful. Um, We've looked at the, the levels of perceived relevance and usefulness of the Get Ireland Walking initiative and the factors that influence that. Um, again, significant increase there, which is brilliant. And we're looking then at sustainability and how that's factored into the Get Ireland Walking initiative and the various strands. There's a few pointers there, um, and we will publish this hopefully in the relatively near future, and you'll see some of the programmes and, and, and the success of the different elements to it. Um, other key deliverables from the, this programme, you can see I, um, some of them there, some of you, and I, I'm not actually sure what the balance is between Irish and non-Irish. You'll see, for example, the one with the four sheds, like shul, is, an, is a programme, that's an, an Irish word about referring to our men's sheds, which is encouraging, promoting, and this was mentioned before, that men are generally less active that, at walking, less inclined to walk than women. So we've had to target specific programs at men. So we've gone to the men's sheds where the men hang out and go to them and developed a program to, to work closely with the men's sheds. And that's the men, the men's, um, the sheds at Shul program. We've also these walking the talk with men through the men's development network. Um, and Robert mentioned mental health, and we have one of our probably most successful programs that we run through Get Our and Walking, apart from the community walking group, and we have over 700 community walking groups now, is the Woodlands for Health program. And this is a mental health initiative in conjunction with Quilcha, who's our forestry commission, um, ourselves, the, part, the HSE, and we work together to, to provide walks for people who have mental health problems, who, who, who can walk and talk without having that, you know, pressure of being in an enclosed kind of room sitting opposite somebody with the tissues and so they can just go for a walk and talk about their problems and it's been incredibly successful that program. Um, we also, um, we again, so Jason works on the development of our National Walking Days and I'm going to mention that again in a minute. Um, so we, multiple programs, we work on social prescribing, the Active Schools Walkway, we have 900 schools signed up to the Active Schools Walkway now. So all this bearing in mind is with a tiny, tiny team. So that's why I keep referring to partnership because, you know, four people can't deliver all this. It's about working together. Um, 
So the next step for us is now to implement these findings and work on, on what we've learned from them and make sure that the next um, steps are, are relevant and appropriate and really take on board the findings that we've, we've, ma we've made so far. We want to build on the successes and continue the, mem the momentum and work with maybe even more new partners. We already have approximately 60 partners that we work with in this area, um, and, and that is going to be the key to, to the future success of it. Um, we have a few key, um, key, I suppose, future um, events coming up for us. The upcoming strategy launch, we'll be launching the new um, Get Ireland Walking strategy, the next generation strat strategic plan, which will bring us up to 2025. We hope to launch that in the very near future. We have European Week of Sports starting next week, um, and we have National Walking Day as part of that on the 25th. And in 2020, we had 700,000 people walked during the National Walking Day. So it's a very successful initiative. Um, one thing we're also looking forward to is the launch of, um, and again, Again, partnership comes in here, the National Outdoor Recreation Strategy, which um, is a partnership with the Department of Rural and Community Development. So we have, we have we've constantly working on these kind of partnership programmes and, and how they work to, to, to change what we do. Um, so just really to conclude, really, I just wanted to just say, look, I want to thank um, and TUD and Lorraine and the Walk 21 team and everyone involved in this. And, you know, we, we had hoped we'd have you out visit us in the campus, that didn't work out, but, you know, we hope that anyone who's based here in Ireland will come and visit us on the campus sometime and see what lovely facility we have out there for walking. Just come in the daytime, it's a parkland, um, not lit up. Um, so we've had this conversation. But I just also want to thank my own team. So Kira Munley, who runs the Sport Ireland Outdoors Unit, because we've recognised, and, and even like our teenage girls are saying that, you know, that they're like the... the, the the, the biggest challenge for us in trying to get people active is teenage girls. And um, we've identified that teenage girls would like to be more active outdoors. And maybe that's something that comes from the pandemic, but it's, a, it's an interesting finding. And we have an outdoors unit, that, so that's really useful for us to, to promote that. But Kira runs our, our outdoors unit. Unfortunately, I have to run after this, but if anyone's looking to talk about um, our, our own work, Kira will be here to talk to you about it. Um, also to thank our key funders, Healthy Ireland, and, and as I mentioned before, Mountaineering Ireland, who've really made a difference. But more than anyone, I'd really like to thank Jason, and I don't know where Jason is, but I'm quite sure he's here. Oh, there he is. Jason is absolutely the lifeblood of this programme, and he's also the energy ball and the Duracell bunny that runs this programme. <laughs> So that's all, just thank you very much and um, thanks for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to hearing Joe because we, we've already made useful connections and I think that's what these kind of conferences are about, what we can do better in the future together. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr May. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, interesting to hear uh, walking is that gateway action to physical activity uh, in the context of some of the anti-doping work that you've done. It's a great segue. Um, and I think also some of the points that you've made about asking you know, what is unsustainable about what we're doing now, because in order to understand what is sustainable, we have to ask ourselves, well, what are the actions that we're doing now that are unsustainable? So all those hidden risks in terms of inactivity within the population, the hidden costs around health care, um, and it's really interesting to measure that and see those metrics were up in terms of physical activity during 2021 to see we haven't completely forgotten um, what it meant to be able to get out and walk together during the pandemic. So we're still at 71%, but that means that there's 29% more to go. Um, so thank you for that perspective. And I suppose on that uh, kind of uh, call to action. I suppose our, our next speaker is all about action and practice. Mr. Jones Seymour is a head of active travel uh, investment at the National Transport Authority in Ireland. Mr. Seymour is a chartered civil engineer and a fellow of Engineers Ireland uh, and Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation in the UK. Mr. Seymour has over 30 years of experience in designing and delivering complex sustainable transport projects on urban streets in Ireland, in the UK, in the Middle East, and in Africa. And he has particular experience in designing and delivering active travel projects. So we really look forward to hearing about those in terms of Ireland's story around the initiatives and following on from Dr. May's initiatives around Get Ireland Walking. And Jason, you are an epic hero, I have to say. So it's been a pleasure working with you. I'd uh, love to welcome Joe Seymour up to the stage.
my team are sitting there wondering who's going to get picked out for uh, being such a good person. <laughs> We're a good team. <laughs> so what we do in the National Transportation Authority when it comes to active travel is we, we fund the projects for the local authorities. Uh, we look at the projects, make sure they're of a high quality, and uh, we, we basically support them in delivering these projects. At the moment, we have 1,200 projects running in Ireland, and we're spending in the order just under 300 million a year, uh, which is a tenfold increase in three years from what we were spending in active travel. Ireland is a little bit different to many European countries in that we did have actually quite a good active travel um, uh, ethos in Ireland because we were poor. So from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, we had a lot of walkers, cyclers uh, uh, all over uh, our cities. When I was growing up, it was the norm to be cycling to school and things like that. We often talk about that we need to go to Holland and other places to look at what the infrastructure was like. We actually need to step back and look what was behind us in Ireland and see what, what we had in here in the past. Now, I'm not saying it was perfect. 1969, RTE, our national broadcaster, was already doing a programme on uh, the difficulty for pedestrians moving around uh, Dublin city centre and the lack of pedestrian crossings. So it was interesting. It's actually really worth searching this out because the narrator is Frank Kelly, who's, uh, who was on Father Ted uh, years later, and it's very funny. Um, we then moved on. We, our economy started to explode, and we went, um, our, our main port, is actually just down the end of the, in the city, and all of the trucks that were now coming out of our factories, one of the big, biggest manufacturers uh, is around the Dublin area, all ran down through the port, through the busiest pedestrian crossings in the city. And you can imagine what impact that had uh, for a period. We then, thankfully, got a Dublin port tunnel, and in other cities, we generally got bypasses. However, there are still many towns around the country which still have too many trucks going through, which makes it unattractive for active travel modes. We are in a congested environment, though. Our, our, our booming economy, which is, goes up and down, but it generally comes back, uh, we do have very, very heavy traffic. We are generally in the high ratings uh, of any of these uh, 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 indices, Tom Tom and things. We generally are up the higher end of those because of the congestion. So how do we get here? We're talking about the decade of change in the next 10 years, but we need to step back, look at what, the generation, what happened in the last generation. So I'm just looking at 1986 to 2016. So that's a generation. That's not that long ago. I was a teenager in 1986, so we're not talking about a bygone era. Our car ownership has increased from about 700,000 vehicles in Ireland to over 2 million in that period. Obviously, that's related to the economy. Our, our, our employment rate went from 1 million people employed in 2000, or 1986 to over 2 million in 2016. So it is directly related. We didn't just buy houses, we bought cars. What, how did that impact on things? In terms of travel to work, it changed a little bit. More people drove, less people used uh, self-propelled, which is the green line, foot and bike. The blue line is public transport, reasonably stays the same, and the orange line is car, driver or passenger. But when you start looking at the people behind the workforce, the children, the students, you get a very different picture dramatic change over that period on how we travel to college. So college, 18, a place like this, uh, in 1986, or when I even went to university, most people um, walked or cycled uh, uh, or barely used a car. But now it's completely shifted. It's now the car is the main mode. You go to a lot of universities in Ireland, you've got very big car parks. Kept going down, keep going back. Secondary school, same thing happened. Interestingly, the switch from the majority going by car and uh, foot happened about five years previous to when it happened in college. Primary school, exact same thing. Again, five years previous where the, 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 the change from the, 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 the car to the active mode happened. Not a coincidence, I don't think. So we have our people, we have our primary school kids, they get to secondary school, they keep going the same mode, and so forth as they go up to college. That's one of the, the key actions that we need to change. 
The other aspect of this is our children are not traveling as far as they used in the past. Their, their, their area where they can go independently is much, much smaller than it was in the past. And that needs to change. That's also generating huge traffic problems in our urban areas where everybody gets dropped to their sports, um, their, whatever sports event they're doing, the playground in the park. You drive to the park to go for your walk around the park, that type of thing. It is generating a huge amount of travel uh, during, the, during the day. The, what we do find is, though, that most of the trips we do are easily done by active modes, and that's quite important. We asked questions in terms of the NTA. We, we generated a walking and cycling index in 2021, and we did it a few years earlier. And again, we keep doing it, and we're going to spread it to the other cities over the next few years. What do people want? Why would they walk more? More, better infrastructure is key, but also locations to go to in your local area so that you have your shops, you have your medical facilities, all of that is in within your walking distance, 20-minute towns, whatever you call it. And would you agree, what they, they were asked, would, what would they agree to? And 74% increased space for people socialising, walking and cycling. You wouldn't think that when we put one of these projects out for public consultation that there is dramatic support, but there, there is. It's just unheard of. Um, creation of 20 minute neighbourhoods, 80 something percent, 84 percent in support, 77 uh, percent in, in, in support of low traffic neighbourhoods. So we're, we're, we're here now, we're at the start of the decade for change, what do we do? First thing, we were really, really lucky. New government came in and uh, made a massive commitment in terms of funding. So it changed from about 30 million a year, 30 to 40 million a year, to 360 million, or 20% of the, the overall transport funding. That is a dramatic change. And we've tried our best to spend that quickly. It is difficult, because you do have to ramp up, and you have to get projects, and it takes 18 to 24 months to get through planning for projects. But we did a reasonably good job. We spent 183 million last year. We're on target to spend 280 odd million this year, which is actually our full allocation, because the 350 million also includes another 60, 60 plus million for greenways, which is under a separate program. So that is a big difference in terms of funding. And what has that achieved? A lot more cycle facilities. So uh, this is kilometres, and so we're talking about 100 kilometres of cycle facilities a year being produced and almost 200 kilometres of pedestrian facilities. Everybody looks at us and says, oh, you're just a cycling office. Uh, we're far more than that. There's as much being put into pedestrian facilities as cycling. One of our programmes that I'd like to hit on very quickly is our Safe Routes to School programme, which we do in partnership with Antashka and the Green Schools. This was a program which uh, really wasn't going here until 2020, and uh, it, it was developed by um, the NTA and the Green Schools team, and it looked at front of schools, making the front of schools safer, the routes to schools safer, and providing cycle parking within the, within the uh, schools. The program was started last year, 900 odd uh, schools applied to be part of it and round one, 170 of those were selected for round one in 2021. So that's just over a year ago. All of the delivery plans will be finished this year for that 170 and we're starting to implement the infrastructure in those schools. We are looking at bringing round two schools out in the next couple of weeks. But some of the interesting things that they do look at when they go into a school is they look at where people are coming from, the obvious questions, how do they get there? So this is just a typical school, un unnamed school, but they all look very similar to this. The blue circle is one kilometre, the orange is two kilometres. Most people live within one kilometre. How do you think people get to school? What's the majority? Yeah. Car is the majority way people get to school. Um, now, that's all respondents, so that's the whole catchment. When you do look at the one kilometre, which is a really easy walk, it's still car, which is kind of astonishing. So, so as part, at the start of COVID, Dublin City Council went out and started putting in um, front of school treatments as a trial basis. Uh, it was as much about creating space on footpaths for, for, for people. We got the Irish wrong on that. Um, not even, I think that one is the, is the incorrect one. <laughs> I'm not looking at anyone. <laughs> there was a few of us in it. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but this is a new treatment that's just been put in the last couple of weeks in Kildare at a school. It looks over-engineered, doesn't it? Loads of, loads of bollards. We have to put the bollards in, because if you don't put the bollards in, the footpaths will be blocked. So they are a necessity until we get stop motorists using the, using the uh, uh, footpaths. We are starting to put quite a bit more attention into the landscaping in these locations, and this is one in Fingal County Council area where we have included su su sustainable urban drainage in the, in the plan. In the first academic year, we got 16 front of school treatments finished, three more to be finished in the next couple of uh, weeks. And we have near, by the end of this year, we'll have 12,000 cycle parking or scooter parking spaces in schools, in hundreds of schools uh, around the country. So we are starting to make progress. And you're actually going to start seeing a lot more of the front of school treatments in the next couple of uh, um, months being implemented. This is an example of a school street, which we take it to an, another extreme, where we shut streets down in front of schools. Fingal County Council implemented one, and Galway County Council, uh, City Council implemented one in the last couple of years. Interestingly, the air, air pollution in the vicinity of this school reduced by 20% when, uh, when these school streets were in place. And we have another one, the model school in Limerick, which will be opened officially later on this week. And that will be, that's, that's an unusual one in that we've spent a little bit more money on doing up the street as well as it's going to be a school street. And another one in Waterford. So these are starting to grow. We have signs starting to be developed now to be used on these streets. They are, can be, they, they're really popular with the, the parents, but not necessarily as popular with the local air, lo, people in the local area. But the good news is people turn up even on a not so nice day. And they, I, I just think the actual, with the people hanging around talking, is a big part of how these are successful. Designing for all. I'm not going to go through the design manuals, but there's loads of design manuals and more to come. Even a gender safety audit is on the way in the next, in the next while. So this project, uh, just give you a few examples of some of our key projects. The coast mobility route along the coast in Dunleary uh, is, our, is a high quality walking and cycling uh, route. Um, which runs all the way along the coast, hugely popular, winning loads of awards in the last while. Um, it was primarily a cycling route, but it has huge benefits for the, the walkers as well, as it removed the traffic from one of the busy streets along next to where people walk. People didn't walk there before, now they do. It was also about creating spaces in a town centre that can be used by people, and not just in the town centre, at loads of points along the way where people can sit and, walk, or sit and chat uh, along the way. Interestingly, as busy in the winter. Maybe because of COVID last year, but we'll see. Hopefully this year it'll be just as busy. Quick video. My name is Tom Feeney and I'm chairman of BlackRock Business Network. What is very evident is that the coffee shops are doing wonderful business and it's all because there are more people on the street. The street is more animated. The pleasant surprise is the fact that BlackRock has become a destination village. People come along the necklace of towns, they come along the CMR, the coastal mobility route, all the way from Sandy Cove right into Black Rock Village. So my name is Bob, um, I'm the owner of the Triggerfish Cook Shop here in Black Rock. When I opened the shop five years ago, we had a lot of locals, a lot of businesses, and but now there's been a marked difference in people visiting Black Rock. They come from Dunleary and they use the, the coastal route, and you especially see it on the weekends with all the bikes around, they come here for coffee, it's a place, it's a scene. What surprised me most about the mobility route is how quickly people have adapted to it and how many people have actually started using it safe it's away from the traffic so people are very confident in using it that one gets a lot of profile gets low to media attention another one we're working on is the Dodder greenway in south dublin county council area in a very different uh, social economic class uh, and my view, this is nearly more important than this, the coast mobility route, as it, uh, as it is really impacting in the local area. It links many towns together, it's quite significant length, and people are walking and cycling between it. And again, it's about creating the spaces along the place so that people can sit, wait, discuss. No more than that, or even play. I'm gonna show you this video, and that's it then for me. I was the greatest opponent of the Greenway before it started. But I would have to admit that since it's been finished, I changed my attitude completely, especially with the number and variety of people who are coming down here now. 
I thought that would be a problem. But really, to me, it hasn't been a problem. And it's, I've enjoyed meeting lots of new people. With the mobility scooter, I was able to come in previously to the kissing gates, as they call them. But it's that much easier without them. You can just drive straight in and out now, no problem at all. For us, I suppose, we've noticed that more people are coming off the roads and using the Greenway for cycling. So it's probably it's safer for them in terms of being off the road as well for cycling benefits. I see more people on roller skates using it and children and everybody's using it. We're at, our, we're at our, the start of this decade for change. We have a lot to do, but for someone who's worked in this area for nearly 30 years, uh, it's a very exciting time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seymour. That was wonderful to see. I think um, it's wonderful to hear that there's 1,200, over 1,200 projects in the pipeline, um, and you've given us a few examples of some that are realized and have changed the hearts and minds of the people in the communities. Um, I think uh, as well, we hope that there's other initiatives out there that you and your team will take from the conference and bring back out uh, across the country and share uh, within Ireland. So that, that concludes our, our formal speakers, but we have probably one of the most important and the most inspiring sessions uh, to conclude with. Yesterday at the Epic Irish Emigration Museum, uh, we held a youth forum as part of the conference, and it was hosted by the Lord Mayor of Dublin City, uh, and led by Kleena Martin, and it engaged primary, secondary, and tertiary students from around Ireland in the discussion about walking. What are the challenges to walking more? What are the opportunities for walking more? Um, and the day was uh, absolutely wonderful. The energy in the room was fantastic. And we have some of our local school children who we met back in April as part of a, a walking event to promote this conference where we walked around Grange Gorman. Um, because as part of the Grange Gorman development, we don't have any car parking as part of our overall footprint here on campus but we do have a primary school. So the Dublin 7 Educate Together School has been a key partner for us as we've developed a campus as a neighborhood. Um, and I'd like to invite up our, our young members of the community who, uh, in answer to the question, I suppose, about how do we get access to men over 45, I think it's through our children. I've seen it at home in my own one. Um, so <laughs> I would really welcome hearing about some of the outcomes from yesterday's sessions and what you guys believe we all need to do for your future. Thank you, everybody. My name is Kleena Martin, and I facilitated yesterday's youth conference. When Lorraine approached me, she really had me hooked when she said the theme was the decade to change. And with that in mind, and the wise words of Dr. Sagaris earlier, we shouldn't teach children to adapt. We need to teach them to act and to change. And with these two amazing girls by my side, they developed what we called a call to action. And they're here to present that to you today. As you can see, it's quite long. <laughs> and, and it's upside down. <laughs> that would have helped. <laughs> Yesterday, we spoke about a few different areas where what's stopping us walking, what are the barriers, what are the challenges, but what are also the solutions? All the children and young people that we worked with, <laughs> it's very long. <laughs> And we also have two boards at the side where we discussed walking for pleasure, the barriers, the challenges. But the children also came up with great solutions. So that really is key. If we're talking about creating capacity and having active, engaged citizens, we need to invest in our children. We need not just to listen. We have to act on what they're saying. And that's what's important today. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much. I'm just going to let introduce you to Eloise, who was there yesterday. Eloise, do you have any messages from yesterday? Um, what was your, what was your, th think of one thing you said you'd like to change. I'd like to change the number of speed bumps on the road. So we, I think it'd be better if we had more on some of the smaller roads as well. 
because there is a lot on the bigger roads, but I live on quite a small road, and a lot of kids like to play on the road, like play out on the road and play with balls or play with their friends, and occasionally cars might come like coming down the road really quickly, and first of all, we might not know they're coming, and there's nothing to slow them down. Thanks a million, Eloise. And up here we've had Sally, and Sally had really good insights this morning when she was starting to talk about roundabouts. And sometimes when we plan our cities, we plan our towns, we think, great, we're putting it a roundabout, it's great, it's going to slow things down. But Sally had one really good insight this morning. Um, that if roundabouts are quite small, then cars often just drive over them, and it makes it harder to like walk safely. And when Eloise said about the speed bumps, I, I, I think speed bumps are great because it makes cars slow down, but often cars go round the speed bumps so they can go faster, but that makes it so they go into the bike lanes when they're going around the speed bumps, which kind of defeats the point of them. So I think speed bumps are good, but they need, there needs to be a way of making them cars like have to go over the speed bumps because otherwise they just avoid them. Fantastic. Thanks, Sally. So as you can see, there's lots and lots of insights, lots to learn from our children and youth. So what we would really like you to do is, throughout your sessions this week, think of the children's ideas, think of their thoughts. We're going to leave this with you. We're going to leave the boards with you. So as you're discussing, just remember them, because the children are the future. We talk about fast-tracking a sustainable future. These are our fast tracks. The children and youth we had yesterday, they are the future. Thanks a million. Take care. I can't tell you how inspiring yesterday was, and I would encourage everyone to come and read some of the thoughts that all of the, the children have generated. Um, they're incredibly wise for their years, and they're saying very practical things about slowing down the traffic on the roads to be able to do things like play. Um, and a lot of those recommendations really resonate with me and my own children, and seeing how it is possible to be out in the public realm and enjoy ourselves safely. So thank you all. So, yeah. Um, I'd just like to thank all of our, our speakers today. Uh, thank you all of the community members who have contributed to uh, the wonderful inspiration and action um, at a local level here that we felt within the TU Dublin community in particular. And I suppose I'm really inspired to see the, the range of examples that have been um, put forward this morning uh, in the way in which we need to evolve our academic practices, how we require a, a much more shared and multidisciplinary conversation at a national, a local, a European and an international level through blueprints that help us actually align things to have that conversation, and how uh, creating a, a new green infrastructure through our own physical bodies as human beings um, in the world can make for better cities uh, and more sustainable futures. So I suppose that this is a, an example of what's to come throughout the week. Um, there is a huge richness to the program. The program team uh, has worked incredibly hard to, to bring about what is there. So I would wish you all a wonderful conference. But before we close, um, and we start to think about lunchtime already. Um, I'd just like to say we've run over a bit now. Our sessions will begin at quarter past as opposed to on the hour. So please do grab a cup of coffee and a snack out front. We've got two different locations within the, the ground floor of each squad. For lunch today, um, we've taken an integrated approach and so we're using the TU Dublin campus across the street where we've invited in a number of organic and locally sourced food trucks to uh, offer you lunch, to sit underneath the canopy of tents. Uh, you'll probably meet some of our wonderful returning students as well as part of that experience, and hopefully you'll, you'll listen to them and share with them while you're here, and equally they'll probably have some interesting insights for you as well. 
Um, in terms of the conference dinner this evening, if there are people who haven't had an opportunity to sign up or it said that it was closed at the time when you did try and register, check in with registrations. We do have some opening places. Uh, we would love to have you all there at the Mount Mansion House later this evening. Um, and lastly, um, I would invite anyone who signed up for walk shops to meet in front of the St. Lawrence's Church, which is across the road. Uh, your guides will meet you there and put you into groups. Um, and please do take an opportunity to have a walk through our campus. We have a beautiful loop. Um, if you need some, some thoughtful time to yourself or wish to, to walk and talk with colleagues that you meet along the way. So thank you all for this morning. And for the, thank you, Broman, uh, for the food trucks, as part of your registration pack, you should have received vouchers for the lunch trucks. So those are your ticket to a meal later. So make sure you have some. And if you don't, go back and check in with registrations. Um, with that, I'll conclude this morning. And thank you very much to all our speakers. Thank you so much for our local community members. Uh, and I wish you all a fantastic conference. Thank you.